much for joining us today on the first day of February. Now, today, in honor of Black History Month, uh, we're going to explore jazz here in Central Park, specifically focusing on one particular figure. That, of course, is going to be Duke Ellington, who lived in Harlem for many decades and influenced the city's rich musical tradition um, in the 20th century. Now, as such, we're going to take a look at the north end of the park, and we're going to examine just a few of the landscapes that, uh, that have some connection to his life and work here in New York City. But of course, uh, before we begin, let's talk about your Zoom controls real quick. So uh, feel free to use the chat feature on uh, your Zoom uh, control bar to say hello and comment. You can also use the Q&A feature to ask any questions. And joining us on the back end today are my colleagues, uh, Desiree, um, and Carla, and they're going to go ahead and answer any uh, inquiries that you folks might have. Uh, we've also enabled closed captioning as well, which you can turn on and off uh, on the Zoom control panel. And of course, we'll also be showing some historic images from the New York Public Library, the Smithsonian Institute, the Library of Congress, and the Central Park Conservancy. And of course, our mission here at the Conservancy is to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and enhancing the enjoyment uh, and well-being of people. All right, folks, so let's get right to it now. So Duke Ellington today is best known perhaps as one of the most well-known and uh, influential swing jazz band leaders of all time. And some of his songs have gone on to become as standards to this very day. Uh, he wasn't actually from New York. He had roots in the Washington, D.C. area, but moved to Harlem uh, in 1919, where he very quickly found a following with his mastery of the big band or the jazz orchestra, which really allowed him to uh, tap into the individual talent uh, of its individual band members. So uh, Ellington uh, would stay in Manhattan for the remainder uh, for uh, many, many decades, and he often would be seen playing in uh, Harlem clubs like uh, Barron's, uh, the Savoy, or the Cotton Club. Um, he would pass away in 1974, but hits like Take the A-Train, Cottontail, and it Don't Mean a Thing are now recognized as some of the finest swing compositions of all time. And of course, uh, Ellington wrote many of these songs during his time at the forefront of the Harlem Renaissance. So let's take a look at the map and see where we're going to be heading off. Okay. So naturally, we're going to start off our walk uh, over at uh, the northeast corner of the park at Duke Ellington Circle. Uh, then we're going to make our way west along 110th Street, uh, examining some of the Harlem landmarks that are very much connected to Ellington's life. Uh, we're going to end off the tour or the walk today over the Block House over the North Woods, but along the way we'll also talk about jazz in the modern day Central Park and how it's still very much alive today uh, into the 21st century. Let's uh, start things off here at, appropriately enough, Duke Ellington Circle, which uh, officially was unveiled in 1997 um, at the intersection of Ten Street and Fifth Avenue, right at the gateway to East Harlem. Now, this statue really depicts um, uh, Ellington standing by his piano as he's held up by nine muses, which initially actually caused quite a controversy since uh, they were nude figures displayed in such a public the memorial itself is placed right in the middle of a very busy traffic circle. So uh, if folks uh, you probably can't see this right now, but uh, right behind the statue, uh, you might be able to see a little bit of the Harlem Mirror. So we're going to be heading uh, west towards that direction very, very soon. Now, stepping back a few yards, you can see the amphitheater-like shape of the monument, really evoking perhaps uh, uh, maybe like a light, lively night scene uh, here in Harlem about 100 years ago when Duke Ellington and his orchestra uh, could regularly be found playing uh, in these venues. Now, Bobby Short, he was the man that made the Duke Ellington Memorial possible. Bobby Short, he was a uh, jazz musician and a singer, and he was heavily uh, inspired by the music of legendary black musicians of the Renaissance. So in 1979, he formed a committee to uh, create a permanent monument in New York who had just died five years prior. Now, if you look up at these street signs, you can see that this part of 110th Street uh, is officially called Tito Puente Way, who was another legendary musician from Upper Manhattan, this time from neighboring East Harlem, which has a very significant Spanish-speaking community. Uh, 
Uh, he was known primarily for his contributions to Latin and jazz, and uh, songs like Oye Como Va really remains a popular staple that's often heard out on these streets. Now, as we cross towards the next stop on our uh, walk, we're going to head into the park via Pioneer's Gate. And continuing, uh, continuing through the pathways, we can see just a little tiny bit of the Harlem Mirror on our left, as uh, well as all the stately bald cypress trees. We usually only pay attention to them in the summer or fall when their needles fall out. But I think they really can look uh, quite pretty in the uh, winter time as well. And here we come to the Dana Center and the adjoining plaza, which is a very popular spot for music, especially when the weather is nice. And of course, everyone's out in the park, usually during the summertime, spring, sometimes the fall, something like that. Now, as we've seen before, the Dana Plaza uh, is home to the Harlem Mir Performance Festival which attracts some of New York's most talented musicians uh, from genres um, as diverse as Latin jazz, funk, punk, and everything in between. Um, it really is an annual tradition here in the North in the park. And of course, it's also a great way to see some of the best jazz performance uh, performers that the city has to offer. Now, it kind of looks like my uh, microphone is cutting uh, in and out uh, for that. I do apologize. Uh, but if you folks can uh, bear with me here for a second. So hopefully I'll try to uh, uh, fix the audio a little bit. Let's see if that did anything. Okay, folks, so let's move on. And this time, why don't we head back out to the outer perimeter walls. Now, as we head back out to the street and turn around and get this view of the Dana Center, we come to the newest named gate in the park since the 19th century. It's called the Gate of the Exonerated. And it commemorates the experience of the exonerated Central Park Five uh, and honors all those wrongly convicted of crimes. It was actually just unveiled a few weeks ago uh, back in December. And as we continue west along 110th Street, uh, known around here as Central Park North, we then arrive at, it, at the intersection with Lenox Avenue, which today is very much a bustling main entrance uh, into the park from Harlem. Things looked a little bit different back in the day. Even back in uh, the 1860s, change was very much still in the air. Now in 1869, as the park was just being completed, uh, this same street corner was still very much a rural part of town with, um, with farms just being a common site. But less than a generation later, the city really started to build up uh, around here. All right, folks, so let's go ahead and uh, move on towards the next stop. And as you can see, uh, we're now moving along towards the northern edges of Central Park. And by the end of the century, uh, you really would have seen quite a bit of urbanization here with the modern day landscape of Harlem as we know it uh, being formed at this very crucial time period. Uh, the areas around the park, of course, have been quite fashionable. And these same apartment buildings that were constructed uh, during the golden age of the Harlem Renaissance, um, these were constructed right as jazz was starting to make it big uh, here in the neighborhood. Just ahead, we can see 7th Avenue, also known as Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard. Uh, the roadway was named after, of course, a congressman by the name of Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who served as the pastor of Abyssinian Baptist Church on 138th Street long known as one of Harlem's most influential black congregations. Uh, Powell served for many decades as a U.S. congressman as well from 1945 to 1971. Now his name can be found all over the neighborhood. So if you actually go up to 125th Street, there's a very large state office building uh, dedicated to him as well as a very large bronze statue uh, in his image right out front. Uh, Powell also, uh, curiously enough, was indirectly, I had a very massive impact on the world of jazz, even though he himself was uh, not actually a musician. So back in the 1950s, uh, pretty much through the 1960s and into the uh, early 1970s, Powell was instrumental in organizing official State Department tours of places like the Middle East, Africa, South Asia, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. Now, Powell invited uh, jazz legends such as Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Louis Armstrong, Benny Goodman, and of course, Duke Ellington uh, to come along on one of these cultural diplomacy tours. 
Now, as they traveled throughout these places, the American jazz musicians that participated in this program, they exposed themselves to the far out sounds of other countries and cultures. In fact, Duke himself was so inspired that in the 60s and 1970s, he released the, the albums Far East Sweep and Afro-Eurasian Eclipse, which really bother, uh, borrowed heavily from the music traditions of the places that he visited, primarily places uh, like uh, North Africa, uh, as well as in the Middle East as well. All right, folks, so let's go ahead and continue on. And we're going to uh, continue walking through 110th Street. First, before we go ahead and continue, I want to go ahead and launch uh, the poll of the day. So, of course, uh, speaking of jazz, um, I wanted to ask you folks, are you a fan of jazz music? So jazz, of course, has had a long history uh, in New York City. And cultural centers like jazz at Lincoln Center really are major destinations for aficionados uh, of this very, very American music genre. Uh, I myself am actually a very uh, long time listener of legendary musicians uh, like Phil Evans, uh, Jacob Astorius, Sarah Vaughn, and Wayne Shorter. And actually started listening to them uh, back in college when I went to uh, Rutgers, New York, uh, in New Jersey. All right, folks, it looks like we've all voted. So let's go ahead and share the results now. And it looks like about 46% of you, a little bit less than half, are big fans of jazz. 38% uh, say it's good, but not really as familiar with it. And in the minority at 16%, uh, not quite jazz fans. So very interesting uh, indeed. All right, folks, let's go ahead and continue on uh, with the walk. And from here, we're going to go ahead and uh, continue on uh, through 110th Street. So from here, we arrive at Frederick Douglass Circle, which officially was named by the city back in 1950. These days, it's surrounded by large, massive residential buildings that were built officially in the mid 20th century. Of course, much has changed uh, since the days of the Harlem Renaissance. Now, this image that we're looking at this is actually a postcard from 1919. So right around the same uh, time period, um, that uh, Duke Ellington and his band moved to New York City from, uh, from Washington, D.C. So here we can actually uh, see something called the Ninth Avenue Elevated uh, Rail uh, Line, which turned a very tight curve around 110th Street to head south uh, along 8th Avenue. Uh, it also was one of the highest elevated stops in the subway at this point in time. So this is a very imposing structure from the moment it was first built up. Today, the corner that we're looking at, this is the Approximate location of the 110th Street uh, Cathedral Parkway subway stop, which serves the B, the C, and sometimes the A train late at night. Now, if you're familiar with Duke Ellington's music, then you know that one of his biggest hits and signature songs was a piece called Take the A Train, which was written by the composer Billy Strayhorn, who was a longtime collaborator. Billy Strayhorn composed a song after being inspired by a set of directions that was written by Duke to get to his new apartment uh, on 157th Street. The direction started off with the words, take the A train, which at that point in time was still just a brand new subway line. And it was also known as like the quickest way to get to Harlem. The song really has gone down as one of the most iconic uh, lines in all of jazz history. And I think it really just is a great introductory song to Duke Ellington's uh, discography. All right, so moving on now, and we come to uh, Frederick Douglass Circle on the northwest corner of the park. Now, the statue and the redesigned circle was created back in 2010, although it was actually named after the abolitionist leader uh, way back in 1950. Uh, along with Duke Ellington Circle on the northeast corner of the park, uh, Douglas Circle forms the gateway to Harlem on 100th Street. Now, while many first-time park visitors might associate the South End of Central Park with its very grand statues and monuments as the main entrance, to many folks here in the uptown community, 110th Street, this is where it all begins. So the statue itself was created by the Hungarian artist uh, Gabriel Ferenc. And the monument features a number of references to Douglas life uh, as both an abolitionist as, and as an escaped slave. So the constellations that we're looking at right now, for instance, they refer to the stars that provided orientation and illumination for those traveling at night. 
The North Star was also the name of the newspaper that Douglas edited uh, from his home base. And the wagon wheels that we're looking at, these represent the uh, hard work and craftsmanship of the uh, many blacksmiths who created the wagons that enabled many of the slaves uh, to escape in the 19th century. Other features of note include quilt patterns and numerous quotes from Douglas's life. It can also be noted that uh, Frederick Douglass spent the last two decades of his life in Washington, D.C., where Duke Ellington also grew up. So there's that uh, connection with him uh, as well. All right, folks, so let's head back inside the walls of Central Park now, and uh, we're going to go ahead and make our way through the upper level of uh, 110th Street Bridge. And we're going to go ahead and follow the drive up for a little bit to uh, get towards our next stop. And of course, here we get to the Great Hill. Uh, the Great Hill is relatively quiet right now, but when the weather is nice, you might see tons of local folks uh, and visitors out here. Jazz, of course, has been a popular summertime staple uh, and tradition here in this area for a few years now. The Central Park Conservancy runs a free concert series here called the Great Jazz on the Great Hill, which usually runs uh, in late summer. Now, in order to get to this event on the Great Hill, uh, visitors would need to enter the park via 106th Street, just off towards the west. Now, officially, 106th Street is known, uh, of course, as Duke Ellington Boulevard. Now, while Duke himself never actually lived in this town, he did own a few properties uh, along Riverside Drive that he gifted to family members uh, and friends. Again, really hammering down uh, Duke's legacy as not just a legendary figure, uh, figure in the world of jazz, but also within his local community. Okay, everyone, so from the Great Hill, we're going to walk uh, through a little bit of the North Woods, and then we'll take a, a look at one last stop before ending things off for the day. So uh, heading north, we now come to one of the oldest existing human-made structures in all of Central Park. Uh, this is called the Block House. And it's been sitting here uh, for well over 200 years now, being a close watch over the neighborhood just down below. Now, while at one point it was a military structure that was filled with soldiers armed with things like muskets uh, and cannons, these days are more likely to encounter park goers leisurely wandering around the North Woods. Of course, we've examined the blockhouse's uh, military history many times before on our weekly walks, virtual tours, and other programs. But one aspect of the structure that I think uh, is really always interesting to me and you know, always uh, find fascinating are the incredible views from this high point. Now, directly north of where we are, the topography of the land is considerably less rocky uh, and much, much less hilly. It's definitely much more flat uh, in Harlem, especially in Central. Thus, the incredible views of uh, Harlem, and Upper Manhattan as well. Now, if we zoom in closer, we can see a very small, tiny portion of the George Washington Bridge, which is located uh, all the way up in the heart of Washington Heights. This, by the way, is the only spot in the park where you can see this bridge, which is located many, many miles uh, away. Now, you're probably not gonna see this from this vantage point, but uh, Ellington's apartment, for many years when he lived in New York, was located over at 157th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. So right near the border of Washington Heights uh, and Harlem. Of course, looking beyond the large apartment buildings, we do get a chance to reflect on Duke Ellington's life and the neighborhood that he called home for many decades. It's also, uh, it's also the spot where we are going to end things off for today. So folks, I thank you all so much for joining us on another weekly walk through Central Park. Now, don't forget to check out some of our other uh, tours and programs happening within the next few weeks. So next uh, Thursday, February 9th, in celebration of Black History Month, uh, we're going to have a virtual tour called Harlem's Backyard, where we're going to talk about its history as the capital of Black America in the 20th century. So you can sign up uh, for that using the link uh, in the chat below. Uh, but of course, uh, I thank you all so much. Now, you can follow us on all of our social media channels as well, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And we'll sign off here for now, but if you do have any questions or anything like that, uh, please do let us know. So from everyone here at the Central Park Conservancy, uh, stay safe and be well.